Coroutines. What next? So there have been some really excellent introductory talks on coroutines. Uh, last year, CppCon um, had lots. Phil did one, as did Pavel, Andreas, several others. Um, uh, so the question is, we've got lots of good kind of introductory material relating to the sort of coroutine mechanisms. And that was definitely very, very needed, very necessary in my view, because they are complex, they are tricky to understand. Um, but what do we need now? So what, what do we need to bring coroutines into kind of more widespread usage? So anybody got any ideas? Anybody want to shout out anything? A task. Uh, yes, well, that, that's a, an, yeah, an excellent comment, Dima. Yes, task, that's right. A um, few ideas. Um, yeah, exactly. So stood generator. Yeah, that would be great. An implementation of stood generator. Um, so that would be that would be really helpful. Um, anybody got any ideas? Sorry. Event yes, event loops. Um, any more? Go on. Halo. Halo. Yep. Halo optimization. Yes. All right. Brilliant. So, go on, Martin. Sorry. Networking. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you guys have got some really good ideas. Um, when I talk to people about coroutines, particularly, you know, sort of younger members of the team and stuff, first thing that they're sort of, you know, sort of confused about is how does it fit within the wider concurrency framework? I mean, we've got coroutines, but we've got quite a lot of concurrency mechanisms, a lot of concurrency primitives. How do we, you know, sort of fit that together? What do we know, you know, when do we know when to use one and not the other and that sort of thing? So we're going to look at a bit about fit within the wider concurrency framework. Um, the other thing which I hear often is more examples. Uh, so both from the real world, so real world examples of deployed coroutines in real use, and also examples for learning. Um, so, you know, how do we get into, uh, you know, sort of things in a more practical concept? Empirical measurements. So, like I said, I've seen a lot about coroutines so far, but um, nobody really has said a great deal about empirical measurements of coroutines, particularly in relation to how we compare coroutines to other forms of asynchrony. So things like callbacks or even stackful coroutines. Um, so we're going to look at a little bit about empirical measurements. And then and then everybody mentioned, so DeepMar, Martin, library support, Halo, what is the future? So where are coroutines going? Um, what's next? What's coming in C++ 23, 26, and beyond? So outline for the talk. Uh, we're going to talk about concurrency. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how coroutines fit in, in modern C++ concurrency and also how they work. So we'll go through a little bit about the mechanics of coroutines because I think no matter how many times you hear that, um, it always helps. You know, it's always like a little bit more uh, understanding that comes from that. So we're, we're going to touch on that. Um, then we're going to look at a, a real-world example of using uh, coroutines in mobile wireless networking. So this is a real product that I've been developing in my company based on coroutines um, that's designed for mesh networking. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, how that works, and you know why coroutines were particularly appropriate in that context. Um, then we've got a nice C++20 example. So we're going to look at uh, web serving with Boost Beast. Um, one of the nice things about Beast, has anybody, anybody had a look at Beast at all? Yeah, yeah, a few people. Um, so Beast's really nice library. It's built on top of Boost Asio, uh, which for those of you that sort of know me a little bit, know that that's my, you know, sort of favorite networking library. Um, and what it gives you is basically a, is a, a, a really, you know, sort of nice way of creating sort of web servers, web clients. You can base it on HTTP or WebSocket, um, and it works really well. But the key thing about Beast is what came in 1.81, uh, which was the Boost release just before Christmas, um, was support for coroutines. So C++ 20 coroutines and stackable coroutines and asynchronous kind of programming. Um, so we're going to look at some examples of that. And like I said, what we're going to do is I'm going to do have three examples, so three code examples, so an asynchronous version, um, a version based on boost coroutines, so stackful coroutines, uh, and obviously C++ 20 awaitables. Um, so C++ 20 uh, coroutines. And we're going to look at those three things. Then we're going to do some empirical analysis. So we're going to use um, a tool called Apache Bench, which, has anybody heard of Apache Bench at all? Um, well, it's like a, it's a benchmark tool for benchmarking HTTP server installations. So typically what it tells you is how many requests per second your HTTP server can support. Um, so that's quite useful as a sort of uh, metric that everybody can sort of grasp and understand within the context of a presentation. It's quite a nice way of, of actually looking at analyzing the performance between the different approaches. Um, then we're going to sort of finish up. We're going to look at std generator, std execution, and libunifex 
as well. And you know, that's going to sort of um, uh, round us out, basically. OK, so a quick note on the example code. Um, so it all builds with GCC 12.2. Uh, the reason I went actually for 12.2 is because it's actually got quite good, well, very good support for C++ 23's um, stack trace, so lib stack trace. So, and that's actually quite useful um, sometimes as a sort of debug mechanism. Uh, with it. It's quite insightful to sort of, you know, kind of pair that with coroutines a little bit, particularly stackful coroutines. So it's quite useful. Um, everything, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all based on boost 181. I mean, 182 has just come out. Um, literally a few days ago, but all of this work was done um, on Boost 181. Um, I'm using Swig, uh, which is a Lua to C++ binding generator. Um, so we'll talk a bit about Swig later when we get into the mobile mesh example. Um, but that's uh, it's quite a nice tool. There are others that exist. Some of you may have heard of the, the PhD's Sol3 framework, yeah, which is a, a Lua to C++ specific binding. That's also extremely good. Um, I'd highly recommend that. Uh, the reason that we use Swig in our company is because um, actually you can use it to generate bindings in lots of different languages. Um, so you can have one set of C++ code, and then you can generate bindings in Lua, Python, Go, you know, um, or just by sort of tweaking a few buttons, basically. Uh, all builds with a CMake build flow. So I'm using 3252. Um, it will build with something, you know, much earlier than that. So I think the minimum is actually about 310. Uh, but any sort of recent version of CMake will build this, and um, you'll be able to use the example code. Um, uh, the Lua examples will run with Lua 544, which is the, the most recent release. If you've not come across Lua, I uh, highly recommend having a look at that. It's really good, really nice uh, user community, lots of good documentation. It's really tight, compact, and um, uh, it, well, it works really well. Um, so I've tested all this on Linux, so I'm using Mid-19 and Mac OS X. Um, Ventura. OK, so what we're going to do next is we're going to go, and we're going to have a little bit of a, a very brief sort of concurrency back to basics. But the thing I like about these back to basics sessions is kind of back to basics for experts. Uh, and I do think, you know, it's very worth sort of going over, reinforcing the basics, you know, sort of time and time again. Because if you plug a little hole in your knowledge, at, you know, kind of very basic level, it tends to unlock a, an entire tree of understanding. So. Um, so we're just going to sort of go back through some basics um, uh, just before we sort of get into the kind of the coding in the meat. OK, so concurrency versus parallelism. This is, um, when I talk to the, the kind of younger members of the team and stuff, this is something that often gets very conflated and confused. And I think, you know, getting some, con some clarity on the difference between concurrency and parallelism is quite important because once you have that clarity, it really, you know, it really helps your understanding. So... Concurrency exists when we've got multiple items of work that are in progress. So things like processes, threads, or coroutines. Um, what concurrency is about for me in an embedded context, it's really about harnessing windows of latency. So specifically, in a concurrency context, you've got contention for some sort of executor. So be that a thread or some sort of processing agent. And then when you've got pieces of work that are either blocked or um, have been using that executor for too long, they can be swapped out and replaced with other pieces of work that are waiting. Okay? So it's about, like I said, harnessing windows of latency. If you reach a point where your, your system is blocked, you can swap out a piece of work, swap on another one, and do some useful work instead of waiting for the first one. By contrast, parallelism exists when you've got multiple items of work that are executing simultaneously. So this would be things like threads running on separate CPU cores. The key distinction, really, is that the execution is occurring at the same instant in time. So literally, like the same clock cycle or, you know, or thereabouts. Um, so that's very different to this situation, which is showing sort of a depiction of concurrency, where you've got you know, two work queues, you've got one executor, you've got a running task, and then um, if that blocks, for example, it takes a zero-valued semaphore or it triggers an asynchronous operation that's going to take a long time, that can be swapped off, and then the waiting work package can be swapped on and do useful work in that window of latency, if you see what I mean, or in that window, in that period where you've, you've got time. Um, if we look at uh, a, par a, a, a depiction of parallelism, then you've got two executors. These things are happening at the same point in time. So the two work packages are literally running at the same point in time. I think it was actually, I think it was Arthur O'Dwyer at CppCon 2020 who said, 
parallelism tends to, as a general rule of thumb, it tends to uh, imply some extra form of hardware. So if you think about cores running on, on your CPU, multiple cores, so you can obviously have multiple threads running in parallel at the same time. Um, uh, or even, you know, if you go down to the level of like even looking at the kind of the micro architecture of the CPU, you know, you can have different streams of instructions. You've got instruction level parallelism. And it's, you know, there's kind of an element of, of, of hardware there. Yeah. So there's a sort of granularity that we can, we can um, arrange these, you know, th this kind of model into. So you've got multiple processes running on a single computer that we all, yes, that we all know. Um, multiple threads run within a single process. Yeah? And then multiple coroutines, and this is the thing I think which is it's kind of useful, run within a single thread. So you've got processes at the top of the system, if you like, in the OS. You've got a process broken down into threads, a single process, and then coroutines running within the individual threads. So if an individual coroutine is blocked, well, maybe another coroutine in the same thread can execute, which is fine, right? If all of the coroutines in a thread are blocked, then maybe there's a thread in the same process that can execute and do useful work. If all of the threads in a process are blocked, then a process on the system, you know, you can swap out the process and uh, do useful work with another process. Yeah. Um, so it's about that sort of granularity. So like I said, you know, from a sort of an embedded context, really what concurrency is doing, or as we'll see in the sort of the mobile mesh example, is it's allowing us to sort of harness those windows of latency. Yeah. So rather than saying, okay, well, my my thread has reached this point in its execution and now it's blocked in its entirety. Actually, if you're looking at a thread body and thinking, well, if I call this blocking operation, I could be doing useful work down here, um, then coroutines are the thing to reach for at that point. So I'm also just going to point out as well um, a note of clarification on the terms coroutine and fibers. Um, so again, this is often something that's sort of conflated together, uh, which you know sort of tends to lead to sort of confusion and stuff. So fibers are basically a cooperatively scheduled lightweight kind of alternative to threading. Um, and you can implement fibers using coroutines, uh, but they are not equivalent. So coroutines are not fibers um, because coroutines give you a lot more. Um, so coroutines basically are giving you a um, set of enhanced control flow semantics um, that you can use to implement things like generators, for example. Fibers are giving you a kind of a very good uh, cooperatively scheduled lightweight form of threading. Um, which is exactly what Lua does. And we'll see in, in the code um, in a minute what that means. OK, so let's go into this a little bit more detail. Processes. All right. So the OS multitasks um, by forking processes. We get a context switch when process is blocked, for example, on a semaphore, or we've done some sort of asynchronous operation, or a preemptive time slice expires. So the system decides, OK, you've had long enough uh, on the process. Uh, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to take this process off the processor and put another one on. Um, the overhead of context switching is quite high. Uh, so we've got lots of virtual memory tables. We've got program code. We've got the heap, the stack, file descriptors, signals. They all have to be sort of saved, restored, tucked away in order to be able to swap between processes. Plus, you've got the impact on the hardware. So the caches all have to uh, you know, drain and then, um, and, then, and then get warm again. So things like sharing data, synchronization, scaling are in, in a relative sense of the word, you know, quite tricky. So this was the whole point of inventing threads. So now we've got lightweight threading in a heavyweight process. So rather than swap out the entire process because one bit of it's blocked, actually, maybe there are other parts of that process that can continue to do useful work. And certainly in the context of sort of networking applications and a lot of event-driven applications, that's absolutely true. Um, so a much lower overhead, so a much faster context switch. All we've got to really worry about with swapping between threads is, is the stack, program counter, and a signal table. Um, and interestingly, if we look back through the history, obviously in C++03, uh, we didn't have any sort of threading in the language, but you had to use uh, an OS library like pthreads or something like that. And then in C++11, we got std thread. And then in C++20, we got std jthread. OK. Um, so some other, other terms that I think cause, cause confusion, which are worth clarifying. Um, Reentrancy. So reentrancy, I tend to think of in the kind of the, the old definition of the word. So back in the 90s, basically reentrancy was if you had a piece of code that was interrupted midway through its execution, and then the same piece of code ran in a different context and then returned to the first context, providing that that second invocation didn't 
perturb the first one, your code was re-entering. Okay? Um, and basically, that's what it means. So multiple invocations can run concurrently without, um, without uh, causing um, each other any issue. If you think back, did anybody do um, Mateus's workshop yesterday? Yeah, yeah, it's really good. So there was a swap example uh, in that. So if you imagine implementing swap using uh, a global variable for the temporary, um, then obviously that immediately breaks re-entrancy because if you ran two swaps at the same time, you know, your second invocation would break the first one. All right, third safety. Um, so for me, this is about the avoidance of race conditions. So specifically, um, it's about manipulating data structures uh, in a manner that is safe. Okay, so um, again, sort of similar but related concept. Like I said, very often re entrancy and thread safety, they're sort of conflated together a little bit. And, um, you know, getting those uh, distinct in your mind is, is, uh, is, you know, is a good thing. Um, also, if anybody's heard the term green threads, these are scheduled by a, basically threads that are scheduled by a runtime library of VM. The name comes from. Java, so the early days of Java. Does anybody remember JDK 1.1 back in the 90s? Yeah, it's a couple of, <laughs> it's Pete at the back. Um, uh, but basically, yeah, green, green threads, it was kind of a cooperatively scheduled threading model um, that existed, I think, from JDK 1.1 to 1.3, at which point they moved to OS threads, um, uh, and the name is sort of stuck. But basically, yeah, it's, it, you know, sort of any group of threads that are scheduled by a runtime library or a virtual machine. Okay, coroutines as fibers. All right, so I've talked about having multiple coroutines in a single thread. This is a good thing because it allows you to, uh, as the thread, well, as your thread is executing, if you can do useful work in another part of the thread when one part of it's blocked, then coroutines allows you to do that. Um, scheduled by a dispatcher, which also runs in the same thread. And I think actually, you know, when you see the dispatch logic, that for me was a, a kind of like a hole in my knowledge, and it was one of those light bulb moments. And you sort of you kind of understand coroutines, particularly in the context of fibers, um, in its entirety. Because I mean, normally when you're sort of doing coroutine programming, looking at ASIO and so forth, um, the dispatcher is buried deep in the logic of of the library. So it's uh, you know, so you don't you don't have that you know. So it's like a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, so the nice thing about being in a, in a single thread is that there's no race conditions, there's no issues with synchronization, there's no data sharing issues. It's all within the same thread context. Yeah? So you don't, have a, you don't have to do anything explicit about that. So like I said, it allows you to do work when part of the thread is blocked. So you know, if there's another part of the thread which can continue, then you know, coroutines is, is great for that. Yeah. Um, some really good documentation. If you go and look at Boost Fiber, uh, if you want to sort of really understand fibers, um, go and look at look at Boost Fiber. I mean, it's got some great docs, some great introductory material. Um, same for Boost Asio and Boost Beast, to be honest. I mean, like, just in terms of sort of general learning, um, you know, this, this is a very good place. Okay, so time for a bit of an example, I think. So let's talk about coroutines in the field. Um, so this is a product that my I work for a company called Blue Wireless, which is literally just across the road, um, which still, you know, I find very, you know, um, blows my mind to think that we got this conference here and, you know, the office is just over there. But, um, so, mobile mesh. Okay, so this is about IP networking over 5 gig, uh, 5G millimeter wave, 60 gigahertz modems. So, um, particular, in particular, what we're doing is we've developed an 82.11 AD, a Mac and a Phi, which Blue Wireless call a Hydra. Um, and some software, lots of software, uh, which run on that, which basically provide you with uh, a high bandwidth, low latency sort of form of mobile internet. And it's, you know, the key thing is it's mobile as well. So you can put this on cars, on trains, um, you know, Formula One vehicles, um, high altitude pseudo satellite type vehicles. Uh, you can do quite a lot with it. So it gives you about three gigabits per second of bandwidth uh, across a wireless link up to a range of four kilometers. Um, and this is talking about a box that I can hold in my hands and plug into a 13 amp socket. Uh, and the way that it does that is it uses, rather than being a, a sort of an omni technology, which would distribute energy everywhere, basically, it provides a sort of a focused beam of energy, which is what gives you the range. Um, and that's steered using a, a phased antenna array. So it's not like we're not physically moving these units, but it's, it has a, um, you know, a sort of an azimuth that it moves through. Uh, it's all the current generation of hardware is, is all running on embedded quad-core ARM V8 MPUs, network processors. They've proved to be really good. Um, 
And um, yes, as I say, if you click the link, Blue Wireless Mobile Mesh, it'll take you to the website and you can see um, lots of stuff. Now, I've got a little video next. And I think, you know, this is quite useful because it sort of conveys the technology and it shows you what I'm sort of talking about a bit. But um, so you can see, this is this was a, a, a trial that we did. Um, so these are prototype units uh, for mesh networking. So the idea is that the the Land Rovers can move around freely, and providing that they've got line of sight with each other, you've got a high-speed internet. Um, so this is called a convoy scenario. So you can see the three Land Rovers are running together. Like I said, that's this, this kind of beam of energy. So, and as I say, you can, you can be sort of spread out, you know, up to four kilometers. And then the idea is that the beams track as the vehicles move. And the nice thing in particular about it, because it's a focused beam of energy as well, one of the things that has made it particularly attractive is to people like in disaster recovery scenarios, um, where they go into like a, a place where there's been a natural disaster and you know you have um, instant internet like this. You just drive in and you've got instant internet connectivity. Um, the other thing which is quite useful as well is in kind of defense scenarios, um, because it's a focused beam of energy that you have to have line of sight on, it's very difficult to actually intercept that. So it's not like you can have, um, you know, somebody sort of hiding in the bushes listening to your communications. Um, and then even if you could, even if you did have direct line of sight and you were able to intercept a burst transmission, uh, you'd have to get to umpteen layers of encryption in order to be able to do anything with it. So it's quite attractive from that perspective as well. That's what the radios look like. So we put these on to trains, uh, Formula One cars, like I said, satellite vehicle, you know, sort of high altitude drones. Um, you know, sort of a whole range of applications. Also put them onto buildings as well. So it's quite nice because if you have a, a sort of a group of buildings in a remote location where it's uneconomical to, um, you know, lay cabling, uh, then you can just put these on, on the wall and then suddenly that cl cluster of, of buildings has got, you know, three gigabits per second high-speed internet. Um, you know, so it's, um, so it's, yeah, it's quite, quite fun technology. All right, so why am I telling you all this? All right, well, mobile connection management. Um, the L1, so the layer one, so what I mean by that is really the decision-making about what to connect to and when, because obviously in this very mobile environment, you've got a lot of dynamicity, a lot of things are changing very quickly. Um, it's all implemented using coroutines. So in particular, we're using a combination of modern C++, so 1720 and Lua. Um, lots of asynchronous operations. So it's kind of when you see... Uh, you know, networking is, you know, certainly one source of lots of asynchronous operations. We do things like scanning, connecting, disconnect. These operations may all take, you know, hundreds of milliseconds to complete. Like if I want to scan the horizon on a particular channel, for example, that could take, worst case, like 100 milliseconds. It's actually much quicker than that in general. Um, but we're doing this kind of thing a lot. And again, with connection, again, a similar idea. It might take you know, sort of up to 100 milliseconds or something to be able to actually do the connection. Um, there's actually around about 40 of these operations. We call them actions. And the reason for that will become sort of evident in a minute. Um, so what I'm saying is there's an awful lot of asynchrony in the system. Yeah, so there's an awful lot of times where you're basically waiting for results. Um, but by contrast, you know, there's lots of useful work that you can do in those windows, um, you know, providing that you get your concurrency model right. So we've got groups of coroutines operating in threads. Um, so no race conditions or data sharing limitations. Uh, it's really good actually because when you this, so going back to our sort of model of concurrency versus parallelism, um, what this is giving us is so you've got concurrency given to you by the coroutines in threads which are running in parallel with each other, all right? And when when you get to that sort of you know when, if you can get that working, you really are getting sort of you know to the point where you're you know sort of fairly optimal in terms of your, you know, there aren't many sort of um, opportunities for work that are being wasted. All right, so this is what the architecture looks like. Um, so we've got a mobile mesh lure behavior right at the top. This is really kind of where the, you know, the sort of the algorithmic smarts are. Um, this is what's making the decisions about what to connect to and when, when to change those connections, when a better connection might be available, that type of thing. So there's quite a lot of complexity in that. I mean, it's probably about, 2,000 lines of Lua. But by writing it in Lua, 
it has the massive advantage of it, it can be changed in the field. Um, so you don't need to go through a compilation cycle. You can literally, you can be in a field trial and make some updates to a behavior. Um, and it can also be changed by people who are not C++ engineers. So I'm talking about kind of FAEs, customer engineering, um, even customers uh, will solve their own problems by doing this. Um, whereas, you know, if, if it was, if, if, we were, if, we, if all of that was pushed back onto the software team, um, we would be constantly, you know, just supporting what's out there so it wouldn't scale. So it's actually quite a good way of sort of scaling up your offerings. That talks to a C++ action library. So the idea is that these primitives, so the scan connect, got stats, messaging, logs, um, they are there to provide a, you know, sort of semantic interface to the Lua behavior. So the Lua behavior can, can call down into this and trigger a scan or a connection. Um, and that's bound to the Lua through a swig binding. So uh, that just expresses basically type mappings between, between Lua and the, the action library. And then that's how, that means that you can call C++ from Lua and vice versa, which is really good. Um, so then the C++ action library, that talks to lower level components. So you can see ASIO, which is basically doing all of our kind of networking stack. The logging, which is speedy log, um, which for anybody who's never looked at speedy log, highly recommend that. It's a great um, project on GitHub. It's really nice. If you want to add logging functionality into your program, it's really good. Um, uh, and then the, uh, so the, the scan, connect, and stats actions are talking to something called the Connection Manager API. And the idea of the Connection Manager API is that its northbound interface is very, um, you know, sort of programmer friendly. So it has operations like scan and, you know, please connect for me and things like this. Um, whereas its southbound interface is NL802.11, which is talking to the Linux driver. Yeah, and then that obviously talks to the hardware, the Mac and the Fi, and the radio. Okay, all right. So, got an example. So what I thought I'd do is I'd take this architecture and I'd slim it really down and then put it on GitHub and make it available to you guys and anybody that wanted to perhaps, you know, sort of experiment or do some, do some work with this um, yourselves. So we're going to have an example. So this is about uh, fibers. So we're going to have a Lua behavior that is two nodes sending messages to each other. And what I've tried to do here is um, make the example sort of fairly easy to grasp on the slides. Uh, but the architecture of the, the software, and as I say, if you go and clone the example code, um, that's quite full-featured and quite powerful. So, um, so it means you can extend it and perhaps, you know, sort of do something a bit more, um, bit more interesting than just send, you know, two nodes messages uh, between themselves. So I've included sort of three actions. So we've got something called a connector, a timer action, which is um, timers are also implemented using ASIO um, uh, because it's a very good job of asynchronous timers, and a, a logging one. Uh, and plus, you get the swig type mappings, the CMake build flow, um, some Lua main code. Uh, so it's you know it's fully featured. You could take that and then you know hopefully extend it and do some learning. Um, like I said, you know I want to give you know just sort of uh, just point out there are the bindings. Like I said, if you if you want to basically bind Lua to C and nothing else, that's um, then so have a look at the PhD's Sol three framework. Highly recommend that. That's very good. I've used it, um, uh, and it's you know. Um, it's great, and it, it's still being. If you if you email um, uh, the community, then it's still being supported. So. Okay, so this is the architecture of of what I've done. So, like I said, I've slimmed it down uh, into an example so that you guys could perhaps take it and perhaps draw some inspiration. So, you, so you've obviously got the Lua fiber behavior, which we'll go through in a second. The C plus plus action library that ties into ASIO speedy log. So all of that is bundled up together with a CMake build flow. Um, the idea of this behavior, what we're going to do is we're going to run uh, two processes, two instances of Lua on the same machine, um, just on different ports, and we're going to send ping and pong messages. Um, but it, you know, it's obviously it's trivial to sort of extend that across a network or to use that in a um, you know sort of wider context. So this is the Lua behavior. Um, uh, if we go down to the bottom, yeah. So this is basically how it starts. So this should all be sort of fairly straightforward, I think, for you guys to, to understand. I mean, you're all sort of, you know, sort of ultra expert. So um, the key thing that's kind of perhaps a little bit interesting, oh, let's go back, uh, is you can see that the coroutines are being run, uh, being, being created and run at the bottom. And then the main loop becomes the dispatcher. Yeah? 
Um, and I think, and as I say, this for me was a sort of bit of a light bulb moment. So when we get to the dispatcher, uh, you'll see that. Um, certainly doing it in, like I said, if you try to sort of uh, build these ideas and build this knowledge in, like, with ASIO or something, it's quite difficult because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of finesse that's there. Okay, so. All right, so this is the, this is the ping fiber. Um, so what you can see is it looks, it looks very much like a thread. Uh, so we've got a while true loop. We're going to call connector send. Um, so by the way, where, where I'm doing this up here, so I'm saying local timer equals actions.timer. Actually, what I'm doing is instantiating a C++ object there. Um, so we'll see in a minute. So that's in the actions library. Actually, what I'm doing is instantiating that, and I'm, I'm, I've got a, a local handle to it in Lua. So it looks very natural. It feels very natural. Um, and then we've got what looks like a thread body. So I'm going to send a message on a remote port. So I'm going to say ping. Um, obviously, if you wanted to do this across a network, you could change local host to something you know, more meaningful. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to enter this loop, this repeat until loop. So I'm going to wait until a message is available. And I'm going to sort of go around this loop. I'm going to check. And then every time a message is not available, I'm going to yield the coroutine. So I'm going to say, right, there's nothing for this coroutine to do. I'm going to go and do something else. So let another coroutine access, you know, and run itself and check. When we've got a message, then I'm going to print it. Um, and I'm going to uh, wait one second. Again, um, I'm going to do that with a non-blocking timer. So I'm not just going to sit at this point and wait for a second. I'm going to start off a timer. And then I'm just going to go around the loop basically saying, is it waiting? Is it waiting? Each time I yield, I yield to the dispatcher. So the dispatcher will run the next coroutine in the sequence. Right? If that coroutine doesn't have any useful work to do, it will yield back to the dispatcher, which will run the next coroutine and so forth. And eventually, I'll come back around the loop, and it'll be my turn again. And I'll say, oh, OK, the timer has expired. That's fine. Um, we can go around the whole while loop, start again. OK. So this one's the Pong fiber. Um, exactly the same, so it's very symmetric, except all we're doing this time is we're just waiting before we actually send our Pong message. So we're going to wait first. Um, you don't actually need to do that, but I thought it was just, you know, uh, it just that was just the way that I happened to sort of code it. And then this is the dispatcher. So this is the thing, like I said, the thing to sort of try and, um, in terms of sort of building a kind of an abstract understanding of coroutines as fibers, this is the bit that I think is missing in quite a lot of the sort of the, you know, the kind of the complexity of the, you know, the sort of the big libraries. Um, so the dispatcher says, okay, we've got uh, a timer, which we'll create at the top. Then we go into our while true loop, um, which is, you know, like I said, it's almost like a thread body. And then for each coroutine, what we're going to do is we're going to resume that coroutine. If it's finished, right, we'll print a, print a message. Um, if not, we'll go on to the next coroutine and run that one. Yeah, and you, so you go around this loop, and then the coroutines, the individual coroutines, are doing processing, and then they're yielding back to the dispatcher. And each time, um, a co you know, a coroutine does that, the dispatcher runs, and you know, and that's how the whole system operates, basically. Any questions on that? Uh, yes, so the dispatcher's going, but it's got a, did you notice there was a, a blocking wait in there as well? So it doesn't, it do, it's not busy waiting. If you don't, if you don't have a blocking wait somewhere, um, then you'll just consume, you know, 100% of the CPU and you'll be, um, you know, uh, you'll be unpopular with your colleagues, basically, so. <laughs> um, okay, so this is connector action. So this is, this is some C++. So we've got, okay, if we look through um, some sort of, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we've got some constants. We've got constructor, a destructor. Um, I've got a send method, which is what we're actually going to be using. I've got a send method, which is what we're actually using to do the transmission. So that's talking to ASIO, and then that's doing the network comms. Um, we've got uh, something that's saying, basically, is message available? So that's effectively processing any messages that are being received. Yeah. Um, because this, this action is doing both send and receive, if you like. Um, and then the, the get next message is just taking that out of a queue and presenting it to Lua, basically. Yeah. And if we look down here. 
so this is how TCP connection is modeled. Um, so we've got, uh, so it's just wrapped into uh, a class. The one thing I'll say to be really careful about when you're doing asynchronous programming is object lifetime. So I think if everybody's sort of done lots of asynchronous programming before, object lifetime is like, you know, sort of key source of issues and bugs. Um, in particular, if you're finding that, you know, you either find that your resources are being exhausted, in which case you, you're not closing, you know, not closing things down fast enough, um, or, uh, um, uh, well, the, you know, or your resources are expiring before um, they've actually been used by all of your callbacks. Yeah, so um, with asynchronous programming, just pay attention, yeah, be really careful of object lifetime. In particular, we'll see some techniques in a minute about, um, uh, well, how to do that. So you see an awful lot of use of things like shared pointers. Um, shared pointer is actually a really good way of, of keeping something alive because you can pass that through a, a stack of callbacks, for example. And then when the last callback is fired, uh, it all ripples up, the shared pointer expires, and then it's, um, you know, the object's destructed. Okay, and what have we got? Okay, and then this is the CPP. So this is just to sort of give you guys, like I said, this is probably, you know, sort of about as much code as I'd ever put on a slide in one go. Um, but I'm just going to sort of, you know, I think it's here more for reference than for you guys to actually sort of read in real time. But you, you, you also, you know, you're all super savvy. So I can, I, I know that I can just scroll through this gently um, and it's probably enough for, for you guys to really sort of understand um, what, what I'm doing, basically. So, uh, so there you go. See, opening a connection, um, calling an ASIO connect, then a write, which is sending out a message, um, and then returning success. So, okay. And then the messages that are coming back are just being put onto a vector, um, and we're just, just allowing Lua to effectively, you know, just check periodically. It has a message arrived. No, well, okay, our, our code routine yield. Go let some let something else do some work. Um, yes, a message has arrived. Right, well, let's pull it off the queue and and use it. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of callbacks. Which um, what we'll see later is actually one of the nice things about coroutines is that a lot of that. So that looks extremely complex. Yeah. Um, but one of the nice things about coroutines is that it allows you to sort of write asynchronous code as if it looks like synchronous code. Um, so we'll see some examples of that when we do the boost beast, um, which is coming up. Okay. Right, so this is like a tiny video. Um, so this is just, again, so rather than kind of give like explicit instructions about how to sort of build and run this, I thought what I'd do is just generate, you know, write some, do some screen captures so you can, if you want to sort of go and get claim the examples, you can watch these videos and use that to sort of show you, you can see exactly what I'm doing and how it should work and stuff. So. Um, so hopefully that's probably a bit more useful than uh, you know some static documentation. There is there is documentation provided with it as well. But um, but so what you can see is so this is uh, so I've generated some swig bindings. So uh, and I'm just building some executables. Which is almost done. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll show the program actually running so you can actually see it. Um, but like I said, the idea is that, you know, if you go and git clone the code and you want to sort of try and make it work, then you can sort of follow my command sequence and, you know, and sort of work through any issues and stuff. Up, up stuff. Okay, so now we've started one on, so I've just started one on one tab um, and then... Uh, and there we go. Right, so now, okay, so now we've got, the, you know, kind of two nodes that are sort of connected to each other, so they're sending ping pong messages. Okay. okay, all right. Any questions on all of that? Brilliant. All right, so coroutines. Okay, so we'll go through some of the details about C++ 20 coroutines. Um, so like I said, I think it, it doesn't hurt to sort of hear this a few times, and there were some very good talks at CppCon last year, um, which I, I, I've got some references coming up. Um, uh, but, yeah. All right, so coroutines. So when I'm thinking about coroutines, I tend to think of them as subroutines um, because subroutines can be, you know, sort of basically either a function or a coroutine. Um, so 
the, they're subroutines, but they've got enhanced semantics. So specifically, enhanced control flow semantics. So just by way of a show of hands, who here is fairly comfortable with coroutines? C++ 20. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> OK, all right, OK. So there's a few people. Um, so they are invoked by a caller. They uh, return to a caller. And you know the key thing is you can suspend execution. So you can suspend execution, and then you can come back at a later time. So that's really you know kind of like what the co-await mechanism is giving you. So there's a lot of benefits to this. Um, in particular, it allows us to write asynchronous code. So we saw that, that I put on the screen that connector.cpp with lots of callbacks. Um, and you know my immediate response to that is, wow, this is complex. Uh, and yes, it is. You know, I mean, like asynchronous code with lots of callbacks in it. It gets very difficult to sort of follow the control flow, and that that was for a little tiny example. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you imagine in some of the the systems and the servers that you know we sort of we work on, it gets much more, you know, far more complex. So what coroutines allow us to do is write asynchronous code, but with the readability of synchronous code. And when we do the boost beast in a minute, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that, um, because I think you know. It's very difficult to, uh, without an example, it's very difficult to sort of fully, fully understand, you know, or visualize um, what that statement means. So they're really useful for networking. We've got lots of blocking operations, so to connect, send, receive. Um, also, like I said, it, you know, with the asynchronous callbacks, if you then combine that with multi-threading, um, it gets very complex. So um, you know, the control flow fragments, and then you know, you sort of you end up in um, you know, with lots of really tricky bugs. Okay, so what do we get in C20? Well, we get three new keywords: so co-await, co-yield, and co-return. And for me, the star of the show is really co-await um, because that's what uh, is actually doing the suspension and the resumption. Um, and we'll go into a little bit of detail about how that works. And um, we get some new types: so coroutine handle, a bit like a C pointer. Um, it points to Coroutine state, which is typically allocated on the heap. Um, not always. Um, so I think Phil mentioned the halo optimization. Um, but, ge but generally speaking, um, you know, state is, is uh, allocated on the heap. We get some traits. And we get some awaitables. Um, so suspend always and suspend never. Now, what these typically used to do are, well, the place where I've seen them used the most is um, for triggering when you want a coroutine to either start lazily, so i.e. suspended when it's created, um, and then be invoked later on, be resumed when it's needed, um, or eagerly, right? So suspend never. We never suspend. It just, you know, it starts running the moment that the coroutine's created. Yeah. So we'll see an example of this in a minute, how this all ties together. Right, so key talks. Um, so I've just, I'm kind of aware that the, I'm about to say that there are lots of good talks at, at CPPCon 2022. I think most of the authors are in this room. Um, so uh, we've got, this was a really good one, understanding C++ coroutines by example. Um, Pavel, um, he did a good one. Deciphering C++ coroutines diagrammatic cheat sheet. Um, Andreas, <laughs> who sat there. Um, that was a really good one. Um, C++ co coroutines from scratch, Phil Nash. That was a great one. <laughs> so thank you for these. Um, and C20 coroutines for, for, for beginners, Andreas. Um, that was also very good. Totally recommend those. The other ones, the other references which possibly are a little bit less well known are um, so Lewis Baker wrote some good blog posts. They're, you know, sort of a few years old now, but um, still very relevant. And I'd highly recommend these as well. I mean, like they're very complex, they're quite dense. But if you really want to understand um, C20 coroutines, if you can, you know, I would watch those four talks and then look at those blog posts. Um, you know, that will really help you. And then if you really sort of persevere with the key references, you're, you're, you know, that, that, that was the way that I found um, worked for me to, in terms of trying to sort of understand um, coroutines, specifically C20 coroutines. OK. So awaitable types. All right. Um, so an awaitable type is something that supports the co-await operator. So it means you can call co-await on it. Um, it basically, what it does is it controls the semantics of an await expression. I'll show you an await expression in a minute. But it's basically the expression that has co-await at the start and then something following it. Um, uh, basically, what the awaitable does is, or the main job of the awaitable type is to inform the compiler of how to obtain the awaiter. Right? And the awaiter is the thing that effectively interfaces the 
um, you know, the kind of the coroutine mechanics that's provided by the language and the compiler to your library or to your code. Um, so we'll go into we'll go into that in a, in a moment. Um, oh, this is an example of a of a an, an await expression. Um, yeah. So I think actually, you know, the, for me, I mean, they can be the same thing. The awaitable type and the awaiter can be the same thing. I think actually it probably makes more sense to um, look at the awaiter type. So what the awaiter does is it defines suspend and resume behavior. So you've got three methods that are really useful. So await ready. Um, what that's doing basically is it's saying, OK, do we actually need to, to do a suspension? I mean, like, has the result already been generated? Um, you know, if we suspend now, if, are we going to just cause ourselves a lot of you know, unnecessary computation? Um, await suspend. This is actually, uh, when the await suspend method is called, the coroutine is considered suspended at that point. And typically, what the await suspend will do is schedule the resume for later. So, for example, in something like ASIO, it will take the coroutine frame, typically, tuck it away on some queue, you know, that's linked to an asynchronous event that says, when this asynchronous event fires, right, this is the coroutine, here's the coroutine handle to resume the coroutine. And then await resume is a method that's basically going the other way. So, right at the point of resumption, just before we are returned to the caller, um, await resume can be used to perhaps extract a result from uh, your library. So like I said, something like ASIO or something, if we get resumed, we can say, okay, well, actually we need to look up a result, maybe do some presentation on it before we pass it back to the caller. So like I said, the awaitable, ty the awaitable type and the awaiter can be the same. Okay, so the return type. So this is the thing that declares a promise type to the compiler. Typically, if you've looked at any sort of coroutine examples and looked at things like, you know, start, that start off with generator brackets T or task brackets T, this is the return type. Um, it declares the promise type to the compiler uh, and it obviously do, well, it does that using um, traits. So like I said, if you've seen things like task T or generator T, this is the, this is the return type. Um, CPP coro, uh, which is not being sort of actively maintained, I think. I don't know. Although there were there were a few commits sort of recently, possibly. I think DeepMar sort of um, uh, uh, that has lots of these return types in. So if you look at the um, if you want to sort of get a handle on it a bit more, I think there's about four or five that it defines. Um, in some of the WG21 papers, the return type is referred to as a future. So just be a bit careful with that because that's using the term future in the sort of classical computer science definition of the word, you know, sort of from the sort of 80s, 70s, um, which basically, you know, future and promise were the two halves of an asynchronous operation. So, so promise being the, uh, um, the asynchronous side, if you like, and future being, um, yeah, the client side. So yeah, don't confuse it with stood future. They're, they are they are you know entirely different. All right. Okay. So promise type uh, controls coroutine's behavior. So we got an example coming up. So don't worry, <laughs> because I realise that a lot of this is it's very dense. I mean, like the whole sort of coroutine. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the whole thing is, it is quite complex. There's a lot of complexity here. So we've got an example coming up. Um, that's going to sort of demonstrate and bring a lot of this to life. So we'll do that in a sec. Um, uh, basically, what it does is it implements methods that are called at specific points during the execution of the coroutine. Um, so I think, as I say, what I'll do in a second is we'll look at an example, and I think that will sort of crystallize exactly you know, what I mean by that. Um, conveys the coroutine's result or an exception if one's, if one's been generated. And again, you know, don't confuse this with stood promise. Like I said, they're entirely different. Okay. All right, handles we touched on. Um, they're basically a bit like C pointers. Uh, you have a coroutine frame on the heap. Um, this is the main, the main mechanism through which coroutines are resumed. Um, and they also give you access to the promise type as well. So if you want to do things like get access to the coroutines parameters, then you can do so via, um, via the coroutine handle. Um, they're not only, they have to be destroyed explicitly. It's typically, that's typically done through RAII in the coroutine return type. So, okay. All right. Here's an example. All right. 
So I thought we'd have a sort of bit of a break from kind of networking examples. Um, here's a, a sort of a fun generator. So this is a virtual card dealer. Um, so you can use this for, uh, you know, perhaps after the conference dinner or something. You, could, um, you know, you could use this to, you know, have fun with. Um, if we look down at the bottom, basically uh, what, this, what this consists of is the generator return type that we can see. So generator stood string. Um, this is uh, entirely generic. So this would be, you know, if effectively what we're going to end up with, or what we're going to get with std generator. So that's coming in. Um, well, it's been approved for C plus uh, plus twenty three, but there are no uh, implementations in in main mainline standard libraries yet. Yet. Um, so generator is defined in standard library, whereas card dealer is a specific coroutine use case. And then the bit at the bottom, so lines seventy eight and seventy nine, are the application. So this is what's, what's using it. OK, all right. So this is a coroutine. How do we know it's a coroutine? Well, we've got co-yield on line um, 72. Um, so that tells the compiler that this is a coroutine. So that means that we need to do specific things in terms of the coroutine return type. So the coroutine return type, you see generator stood string. OK, all right, that's defined above. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, when a coroutine starts executing, so it does quite a few things. So the first thing it does is it allocates frame on the heap uh, using operator new. And then it copies the coroutine's parameters. So in this case, the size of the card deck um, into that frame. Then it constructs the promise object, which we'll have a look at. And then it calls a method called get return object, um, which uh, in effect is the object that's returned to the caller. Um, then we call a function called initial suspend in the promise type, and we're going to co-await the result of that. And that is the thing that's deciding whether or not we want to start eagerly or lazily. So if we start lazily, it means that the coroutine suspended when it's created, um, which is, generally speaking, how most generators operate. Um, or we can say, no, go straight for it, and uh, we can start eagerly and you know, sort of do, um, do that instead. So when that gets resumed, basically the body of the coroutine starts, and that will run through um, this, you know, this code at the start, so lines uh, 60 to 70 for the first time, and then we'll hit this loop, and then we'll call our first co-yield. Okay. So it does some setup, it does some random number generation, um, and, then, and then we hit the first co-yield. Okay. okay, so let's go. So if we look at yeah, the generator, so this type, um, so we're going to forward declare the promise type. It's coming. Uh, and then you know, we can actually sort of give a type for the coroutine handle, which is the, it's just, you know, sort of um, coroutine handle promise type. Um, and then we get into the promise itself. And so this is actually where the current value of the generator is. Yeah. So it's actually on line 18. Um, and then you can see this get return object, which is returning um, uh, an instance of the object, uh, but with uh, coroutine. Um, but, oh, yes, that's right. But yeah, the, the coroutine handle is actually generated from this promise. Um, then the initial suspend, we're returning suspend always because we want the coroutine to start suspended. Um, final suspend, um, again, we always return this uh, suspend always here. And normally this is because this gives you an opportunity to um, effectively, uh, well, do RAII outside of the coroutine so that you can do the cleanup of the coroutine handle. So I don't know, I'm, actually, I'm just thinking, I, I'm not sure what, actually what would happen if you returned suspend never in the final suspend. Does anybody know, Andreas? Do you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, excellent. And then what we do on, a, on an unhandled ex, uh, exception? And then we get into yield value. So this is what gets called when we co-yield. Um, you can see basically what we do is we're just tucking away the current value, returning suspend always. Then we get on to this point. Okay, so these are just sort of regular methods. This stage. Um, so you can see that the next function, what it's doing is it's saying, okay, 
Um, for finding that I've actually got a coroutine handle, so my current coroutine handle is valid, I'm going to resume my coroutine, um, and then I'm using the comma operator and basically saying we're returning whether or not the coroutine is done at this point. Yeah? So, uh, and then until we're sort of done, um, then we keep sort of spinning around in the loop that's in the main code. Um, otherwise, we return false, uh, and that means we're complete. And then value is just pulling out the value um, from the for, uh, that's embedded within the promise, basically, and, and passing it back. So if we look at, if we go down here, so you can see this loop here, this while dealer.next. So that's what's doing the resume and then um, passing back a, a, a value. Um, and then we're just sort of, we're just printing it here. And we'll do that, you know, whilst the coroutine um, is you know is able to continue. So whilst we've got a hundred cards, basically. All right. Any questions on that? So again, a lot of complexity. What what I'd um, do is if you take that example and just cut and paste it off the slide, put it into you, you know and compile it with you know Clang or, or um, GCC, then you can run it and you know sort of interact with it, and it's probably a bit more um, you know sort of you know useful from that perspective. All good. Okay. Right, brilliant. OK, all right, so uh, let's talk about some applications. So we'll talk about some uh, uh, Boost Beast examples. All right, so some observations. Well, C20 coroutines, they're very powerful, but obviously very complex. Um, so at the application level, how do we do things like compare different forms of asynchrony? Um, how do we sort of benchmark performance and you know, kind of evaluate it? Um, also, you know, how, do we, how can we understand what's going on at the hardware level? Um, you know, you know, these are all sort of practical questions. If you want to sort of deploy them in the real world, uh, how do you do these things? And w what's more, what is the, the sort of the methodology for doing this? I mean, you know, it's, so far I haven't seen anything that really sort of tells me how I even, you know, kind of tackle these issues. So we're going to use Boost Beast. Like I said, really good library. Um, it's built on ASIO. It basically gives you HTTP and WebSocket. Um, there's lots of really good examples. So some very good good examples. So you know, um, thanks to Vinnie Falco and com and Co for doing it. Uh, but we've got there's an asynchronous version, callback based, um, uh, a version based on Stackful coroutines. So Boost coroutine in particular, and then C++ 20 coroutines. So the awaitables, which we've been sort of working through. Um, so what I've done here is I've recoded them all for simplicity uh, and to make them sort of amenable to test with Apache Bench. So Apache Bench, for those that don't know about it, so AB, it's a really good tool for benchmarking HTTP servers. It's very sophisticated. It's been around for a long time. You can do a lot with it. Um, it's, uh, like I said, yeah, it's very mature, and um, you know, there's a huge number of options it supports. In particular, something that's quite useful for us is that the number of concurrent requests is configurable. So we can actually uh, we can change that quite easily and use that to evaluate the three instances of our web server. So what it gives you, like I said, is um, requests per second. So the number of requests per second that can be serviced by, um, by your web server, basically. All right, so all right, here's some code. OK, so again, I don't think we'll go through this um, necessarily line by line, but you can get uh, a flavor of what's going on. So by the way, this, is, this enables shared from this. This is a, an, an idiom that's kind of well established for maintaining object lifetime as well. So um, uh, if you you know sort of Google it and have a look, you know you can see um, uh, how it works and stuff. But it's a very good way of basically you, you know you effectively you create a shared pointer from this, uh, and then that gets passed to through your sequence of callbacks. So the last callback that when it terminates, uh, it 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 uh, deallocates your in this case session. Okay. So let's have a look. So, what we've got. so we look at the main code. Um, this will be fairly you know, familiar to everybody. So do some argument processing. We're going to launch a listening port. Um, and then we're going to run the ASIO IO service. So the IO context, which is the kind of ASIO executor, uh, in a number of threads. So we've got four threads. We're going to use the main thread as well, because um, why not? And then what we're doing is we uh, instantiate this class listener. Um, so 
it's going to open an acceptor. Um, cover that. Uh, yes, it's going to. We're going to um, basically everything gets its own strand. Um, so in an, in an ASIO context, um, strands are basically a mechanism for serializing the um, callbacks. So when you've got lots of multi-threading going on, you want to make sure that your callbacks are processed in in logical order, um, and strands are a mechanism for doing that, basically. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, again, I think people have in the past confused strands and fibers and what's the difference, because, the, you know, the terminology sounds very similar. So. Uh, okay, then we've got, um, so yeah, this is doing, doing a session, um, and, and that's it, basically. And the, actually, the session code, is what's providing, if we go down here. So this is basically, so what it's doing is it's setting up a listening port, it's getting an HTTP request, um, and then we're writing out, you know, tiny uh, few lines of code, which are just basically providing a response. So in a web browser, so when you, you know, you sort of browse to this with Chrome, you'll see, hello, Aku 2023 from the asynchronous server. Um, and actually, Beast is a really good way of, if you ever are in the situation where you need to sort of craft up a little web server for some reason, like you want to export statistics or um, hardware information or something like that. It's a really good way of doing that, uh, you know, because then um, you can even, you know, like I said, you can tie it down into the hardware very easily, for example. So really nice, lightweight way of doing that. Okay, all right. So here's a version based on stackful coroutines. Um, so basically what the difference is between a stackful and a stackless coroutine and in C20, we have stackless coroutines. Is stackful coroutines basically um, obviously get their own stack? Uh, so that has limitations in terms of scaling, but it also has some benefits in certain use cases. Um, so, for example, if you've got a lot of intermediary functions that get called, um, sometimes actually stackful coroutines are um, quite useful in that context because the intermediary functions don't need to necessarily be kind of coroutine aware, if that makes sense. Um, so, first thing you'll notice on uh, with the code is that it's a lot shorter. So you can see we've only got 141 lines here, and I think the previous example was getting off 200. Um, and if you just scan through it, again, I think you're probably, most people tend to sort of agree that it's quite a lot easier to parse as well. So we've got some argument processing, we've got an IO context. Okay, I'm gonna spawn a coroutine. Um, I've got some threads which are running the executor, the IO context. Then if we go up a bit. So I've got a, a listener function. Um, I'm going to create an acceptor. Uh, I'm going to set up some options to reuse the address. I'm going to bind to it. I'm going to listen on the port. And then I'm going to go into an infinite loop, which says basically, um, do you know, accept a connection and then spawn um, something called session, which is going to actually do the... which is actually going to do the response. So if we look through the session, um, you can see I'm setting a timeout, creating a request. You know, so immediately the code is a lot more, it's a lot easier to follow. If you sort of compare and contrast that to the asynchronous version we just looked at, which looks a lot more, you know, like, you know, trying to sort of trace the control flow through that was a bit more complex. Um, you can see that this is, you know, for, to my eye anyway, it's a lot easier to read. And certainly if you've got time, you know, at some point, have a look at it, you know, sort of, uh, offline and you know you I think you you probably you know get what I mean. And this is this comes back to this point about coroutines allow you to write asynchronous code with the readability of sort of synchronous code. Yeah. Um, so it just makes it makes it a lot easier to understand and debug. Um, and then again what we're going to see here is um, hello from the stackful coro server. So when you point Chrome at this um, you'll get that. Okay. And then the third one um, is Oops, not yet. <laughs> the third one is C plus plus twenty coroutines. So again, similar idea. If we look, if we look right at the bottom, um, so this is about one hundred and fifty lines of code. So again, it's much shorter. It's much easier to understand. Um, and I haven't squashed this. You know, I, I mean, there's a lot. There's a fair bit of white space here, so you could you could compress this down. Um, but again, it's a similar idea. So you've got some argument processing and I/O context got endpoint creation, um, you've got something basically doing the listening, 
and then you've got something that's basically doing the session, uh, you know, which is all pretty simple, basically. So let's go through this. This line, I thought I'd just put this out. Um, you, in this particular example, you have to rebind the executor to use uh, the ASIO version that supports awaitables. So if you want to really understand that, have a look at Boost Beast. But I thought I'd point it out because it's the sort of thing that, um, you know, probably somebody would ask a question about. So. <laughs> okay, so again, this is a little video. I think what I can do, I can probably... Um, so again, it just shows, you know, basically how it works, and it also, um, it, it'll show you it running as well, which I think is quite useful. So, um, so like I said, what you can do is offline, if you want to sort of try and build this and try and run with this, you know, for yourselves, then you can obviously, you can use this to sort of go through and, uh, and chart, you know, you can see what I'm doing, you can see the commands, you can see what's supposed to happen at each point and stuff. So, um, so okay, so that's built, and then we're going to run three servers. Two, three. And if you switch to Chrome, so you can, so you can see what my home page is. Um, so you can see the three servers basically are running. You can also, if you're really quick, you can see where I'm going on my holidays as well. Because it's in my search history. Uh, okay, so you've got three servers running. Okay, so the key thing is now, right, now we're in a really good position because we've got three different implementations of the same thing, all running on the same piece of hardware. We can run it with AB Bench now um, to do some benchmarking on this. You can also run things like perf on these because you've got these nice little executables. Right, you can run perf on them and then really sort of dig into, you know, kind of what the hardware is doing and, um, you know, uh, lots of other things you can do is, you know, maybe use C++ 23 stack trace, which is quite useful to sort of, you can sprinkle those around in the code, um, you know, get some idea of what, what the stack looks like at various points. So let's have a look at... Uh... Okay, all right, so here are some performance numbers. Okay, so the, um, the leftmost bar is the asynchronous, the red one is, is boost coroutines, so stack coroutines. C++ 20 coroutines is the blue bar. Um, uh, higher is better. Uh, and as you can see, what's kind of interesting, actually, is that the C++ 20 coroutines look as though that they're scaling a lot better. So the, the x-axis is the number of simultaneous connections. Um, so again, that's a nice feature of AB Bench, is that you can say, well, just give me one, give me 10, give me 1,000. Um, uh, I've done this over 100,000 requests, and I've run average this data over about 100 runs. Um, so, but what's kind of interesting is that as I say, as the number of concurrent connections is going up, um, boost, uh, sorry, C++ 20 coroutines appears to be giving the better performance, which is kind of interesting, kind of, you know. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so like I said, this is all, if you go and download the code, you can recreate all of these experiments and, and, and have a look for yourself. Okay, so this is um, some absolute numbers about uh, time per request. So again, same colors. Um, so asynchronous is the kind of the, you know, sort of light greeny blue one. Um, red is, is the stackable coroutines, and then dark blue is C20 coroutines. Smaller is better, um, because obviously you want your requests to be faster. And I'd say uh, as the number of concurrent requests goes up, there's probably not too much in it, really. Um, uh, but, you know, the C20 coroutines, again, you know, it seems to sort of do quite well certainly against the stack for coroutines, um, which as that's, as that's ramping up, you know, you can start to see the effect of um, the, well, the limitations of scalability there. Okay. Okay. Debugging tips. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, doing, doing this kind of asynchronous programming is really difficult. Um, you know, in certainly doing it in a kind of production environment and writing test code for it is really hard. There'll be some of the hardest tests you'll ever write, to be honest. But um, key things are design concurrency before you implement it. I mean, really, you know, um, 
I had this, you know, I remember having this conversation several times with Anthony Williams, and he says, uh, I keep, uh, every, every year I say to Anthony, have you come up with a really good way of like being able to, to sort of do design by concurrency? He says, nope, it's pencil and paper, all right? and, and thinking, all right? thinking about it. But design, you know, so design concurrency before implementing. And it's quite easy to, um, to kind of, you know, because we've got things like std thread and std j thread, it's quite easy to sort of get sucked into that kind of mode of, oh, I'll just start a thread here and fire that off, and we'll start a thread here, and that'll run. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. But it's not, I would say concurrency is not something that you can sort of follow your nose through. You know, if you're going to do any sort of concurrent programming, you know, you know think about it before you, um, you know, before you sort of really work on it. The, the th key thing to do is to sort of eliminate bugs by design, so things like race conditions. So you want to be sure that A cannot race with B by design, um, not be in the position where you're having to kind of react to that in the field. Um, that's quite a hard thing to, to deal with. Um, although, you know, no matter how much you do, you always end up, you know, with some of these issues. Yeah. Um, like I said, be really careful with object lifetimes. Uh, that's a really common source of, of problems with asynchronous coding. Um, if you have objects hanging around for too long, you end up with resource exhaustion. If you uh, delete objects too quickly, you'll end up with sort of, um, well, corruption problems, uh, you know, or things just won't work particularly well. Um, uh, RAII, um, like I said, have a look at std enabled shared from this, very common um, idiom for doing that. Um, it's quite a nice way. You know, you can use tools like LSOF um, to check for resource exhaustion. Do that a lot, yeah? I mean, like, keep an eye on resources, um, you know, because that's something that can easily, uh, you know, sort of um, end up going off at, at, a, at a tangent. C++ 23 stack trace, really good. Um, this is genius. Uh, I'd like to really thank the guys who, who did it, you know, provided a standardized way of, of giving, giving us stack trace, which is really helpful in an embedded context. Um, uh, this can be quite helpful as well. There's, there's good support in GCC 12 too. If you're going to try it, make sure you configure, um, and you're building GCC from source, make sure you configure with enable libstud C++ backtrace equals yes on the config, you know, the configuration line. Um, so when you're doing dot four slash configure, and then compile with um, uh, std C plus plus twenty three, and you need to include the lib backtrace library as well. Okay. All right. So uh, C plus twenty three twenty six coroutine update. So um, std generator was accepted in C plus plus twenty three. This is really good. Um, I think definitely something we really need. Um, Paper is really good as well. If you look at P two five zero two. Uh, it's quite useful. There are, sorry, oh, what's that mean? Okay. Um, there are um, currently uh, no implementations in standard libraries that I'm aware of, although there is a reference implementation on Godbolt, um, which is actually referenced from P2502. So if you want to sort of experiment with it and play with it and have a look at it, um, do that. Um, this is also something else that's very interesting as well as P2300. So this is the std execution framework. So this is the, um, uh, well, std execution is a move to kind of like more generalized asynchronous programming where we kind of have a generalized concept of executors um, in C++, which is very interesting. Um, uh, that's coming, um, and that's targeting C++26. If you're interested in that kind of programming, those kind of ideas, have a look at libunifex. Um, which is a Facebook library, which is implementing those ideas at the moment. Um, very interesting, very good, very, very, you know, very good piece of code. All right, conclusion. Right, so coroutines, they allow us to write asynchronous code um, with the readability of synchronous code. So I think, you know, if we looked at those, the last two of those Boost Beast examples, uh, then you probably got a flavor for that. And if you expand that across an entire code base, then it makes a huge difference. Uh, you know, a very tangible difference to, you know, into the readability of the code and the amount of time you spend debugging and stuff. Fibers, lightweight alternative to threading. Um, uh, yeah, don't confuse them with coroutines because um, they are they are different. There is, you know, sort of a semantic difference. Um, empirical insights really compelling. So I'd like to see a few more, you know, sort of empirical measurements of coroutines in comparison to other forms of asynchrony, um, which. Uh, which I, I think, you know, would help make the decision between which kind of concurrency mechanism to use for a particular task. And then using coroutines in, code, in user code, 
Um, have a look at Boost Azure and Boost Beast. They're great. If you really want to learn about C plus plus twenty coroutines, you know this is um, these. You know these have really good support. Um, this is you know sort of where I would look uh, and persevere with the key references as well, um, because those you know those talks and the um, the blog posts are you know they're really good. If you want to understand C plus plus twenty coroutines, you know persevere with them. I mean it's quite it's complex and you've got to build the understanding, but um, you know those are the materials that. Are, that that are that I would use.